Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this week's ISC webinar. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking um, about all things mental health, and I'm really pleased to um, to hand over to, to George very shortly. Um, George is from Generation Healthy Minds, um, an organisation that um, that some of you will know through um, Mike Thompson. He used to be at Barclays, he's been a long-time supporter of um, ISC, and um, Generation Healthy Minds have recently joined, so I'm really pleased to be doing this, this session with them, uh, particularly because I think this is a really important subject that I know that many people are paying more attention to, and I think there's a lot more that we can do in terms of the focus we, we put on this, both for ourselves, but also for the people we hire, train, develop, et, et cetera. Um, if you're new to the IC webinars, um, this is the go-to webinar platform. Um, we've got the chat function on here, so um, please, Please do engage um, all the way through through the webinar. Um, George will try and keep an eye on that while he's, <laughs> whilst he's talking, but I've also said that I'll help out, so I'll look at the chat. And also, if you've got any particular questions you want to ask, put those um, into the question box as well, and I'll make sure I keep an eye on those and, and relay those in as we as we go along. Um, Everybody who registered for this, um, including yourselves, you will get a link later on today once the system's downloaded the webinar, the recording, so you'll be able to go back and pick up on anything that you missed. Um, that will also go onto our website, so actually please feel free to, to share it amongst your teams and colleagues, because um, I think the more that we can share content like this, keep the conversation going, I think the better um, for everyone within our industry. Um, all right, that's enough from me. It's George who you really want to hear from, so George, let me hand over to you. Thanks so much, Stephen, and thanks for inviting us here today, by the way, as well, to, to share some of this content with you. I, I'm very excited about this. I see it as a wonderful opportunity. Uh, me, myself and Mike and the rest of the Gen Healthy Minds team, we spend a lot of time working with early careers, apprentices, graduates, interns, uh, and sharing some tools and tips and techniques that they can use to put into practice to support not just their mental health, but their, their, their whole well-being, their physical well-being, yes their mental health and that performance element as well but what we have today right here is a, is a wonderful opportunity to speak to some of those who have an influence with your own cohorts of early careers as well so i'm hoping that not only will the the tools and the techniques that i share with you in the session be useful for you personally but it will also be something that you can take back and share with some of those who you have influence over as well um, which is like the ripple effect, isn't it? You drop a pedal, pebble into a puddle of water and the ripples radiate out to however, um, who knows how far. I, I don't want this just to be a one-way street today either. Um, I really want to include you and involve you in the session, you, mainly using the chat. I've got a little menti poll as well, which I'll pop up shortly. Um, but I want to start off just by asking you this question. What have been some of the challenges that you've observed with the cohorts that you, you work with um, over the course of, let's say, the last 18 months since we, we've gone and the world's fallen apart, we've been through the, the lockdown and the pandemic and everything. What have been some of the challenges that you've observed? What have been some of the things, that the problems, the, the issues that have arisen or have maybe just always been there, but now they're even more apparent? So just if you've got any observations at all, just pop those into the chat rather than the questions box. And, uh, and we'll just see, because I suspect that with the numbers we've got on the call, almost 40 of you listening and live, there are probably going to be some similarities. What have been some of the, the challenges? Have you noticed that people have been um, struggling with isolation, for example, or increased reliance on, um, on, on mental health first aiders? Have you noticed that people have maybe dropped their productivity or struggled with feeling uh, motivated? What are some of the things that you've you've experienced and observed? I don't see anything in the chat at the moment, uh, Stephen, but uh, I'm going to just give it a couple of moments because I think that this is such a an a great opportunity to to share amongst ourselves as well and to kind of feel connected to each other and the, the commonality with some of these challenges. Um, some of the ones that I just mentioned there, they are the ones that come up time and again in many of the conversations uh, that, that I've had certainly over the last uh, year and a bit with the different organizations that I've worked with, um, certainly around motivation, um, I think particularly because just this is like Groundhog Day for a lot of people. Uh, we can see here coming coming in lots of recruiters and universities all talking about student loneliness. Yeah, this it's, um, 
we're hoping that this is going to improve now, right? Because we've, we're, we're looking at coming out the other side of this, but, but even so, what sort of an impact is it likely to have had? And how can we support those who are still learning and working remotely? Because I'm sure that for many organizations, that's going to be the future for some time to come. But okay, let's, let's move on. I'm gonna share my screen and uh, some slides to, uh, to take, you, take you through. Hopefully you can now see uh, the Boost Your Early Careers Wellbeing. That's really what today's session is all about. Um, we, we talk about mental health and it's, it's often, well, it's been a conversation that's been going for a very long time and uh, for all of the wrong reasons, it, but uh, in a kind of a very positive way, it's, the conversation has been accelerated over the last little while. Uh, so many more people are talking about mental health and what we can do to support our own and those who we are responsible for. Um, but I want to get a little bit more um, into the details of, of mental health in terms of how we can sort of rate it and score how we're doing on this front. Because often we think about mental health as being, well, I've got a mental health problem or I haven't. And these these two binary opposites and and actually there's a lot of stuff there in between as you can see from this slide here it's actually this this continuum uh, and if you imagine this scale of one to ten if you're regularly down at the one end for consistent periods of time say a few days in a row down at the ones maybe the twos then there's a high chance that you will then be if you were to go to a doctor you'd be diagnosed as having some kind of mental health disorder some ill health um, however we're all capable of um, functioning perfectly well and then having a day or two where we just feel a bit ugh, a bit rubbish a bit struggly and uh, maybe it's a three maybe it's a four out of ten and then we maybe bounce back again at the top end here you can see we're, we're up at the thriving end or the flourishing end and this is where we we, we hopefully we all would like to be spending more of our time um, but the reality is that um, the vast majority are neither at one end nor the other, uh, but we're actually down in the middle zone, which is called languishing. Languishing is, uh, doesn't sound particularly aspirational. I'm sure that many of us would, uh, <laughs> would like to do a little bit better than just languishing with our mental health, but essentially it just means an absence of mental ill health. And really for a long time, this is what psychology has focused on. How do we go from how do we help people who are struggling with their mental health and get them to a place where there's an absence of mental ill health? But there are no way flourishing or thriving when they just have this absence. So positive psychology came along about 25, 30 years ago um, and started looking at what tools can we um, implement or, or share? What interventions can we create that would move people from this middle zone a bit meh a bit blur and move them up towards flourishing and thriving. In fact, there was a wonderful article by uh, a psychologist called Adam Grant in the New York Times a couple of months ago now, and he talked about this. He called he called it the forgotten or third child of mental health. Now we always talk about we don't want to be mentally unwell, we want to be flourishing, but this middle zone is where the vast majority of us probably sit for a lot of the time. We can all move up and down this continuum. And in fact, I'm going to ask you the question right now. I don't have to post this in the chat. I'm gonna give you a mentee poll to go over to and let me know how you're feeling today. If on a scale of one to 10, one is really struggling and 10 is absolutely bouncing around, thriving, flourishing, all of those good things. And then we've got the graded scale in between. How are you feeling today? Now, if you're QR code scanner, just simply hold the camera up on your smartphone if you have one against the QR code and that will take you straight through to Mentipole. No need to put your email address in or any other personal details. Um, it will give you a one to 10. Tell me, tell me where you are on that scale um, and then I'll put the, the results up in a second. If you don't have a smartphone or other way of scanning the QR code, just go to menti.com and pop in the code that you can see on the screen and that will take you to the same place. So if you've all taken yourselves over to the Mentipole, what I'm going to do, I'm going to change my screen share now and we're going to look at the results. Let's have a look. So hopefully, again, you can see the results as, as I am on the screen. We've got some down at the threes. We've got up at the 10. Uh, 25 of you have voted so far. So still a few to go. I think that's just over half of you. 
Um, sevens uh, seems to be a, a, a popular number there. Uh, threes, fours, fives. And, and what we're seeing at the moment is incredibly typical of what we would normally see in a group of around this size, even sort of 20 or 30 people. We tend to have a sort of a peak, a modal average, uh, the most common number, sort of around between six, seven or eight, uh, and then a couple at the top end, a couple at the lower end, um, and then this sort of not quite a parabolic curve that, that tails off to either side. So keep putting those votes in there. We'll gather this information. Again, it's all anonymized, but it gives us a bit of an idea as to you know, where we are at with things at the moment. Uh, let me go back to Keynote, there we go. So again, hopefully now you can see the slide deck. So uh, the reason why this is important is actually it's a wonderful tool as well, because if you're able to check in with yourself and say, well, look, this is how I'm feeling today. This is my mental health score. Uh, normally I'm a seven or an eight, but today I feel like I'm a three or a four. It gives you an opportunity to then start thinking about what you can do to bump things up. Why might I be feeling like this? Why am I feeling overwhelmed or stressed? And actually, it's a wonderful conversation starter with your uh, your apprentices, with your graduates, with the students, with, with whoever you have working with you to actually say, have this common language, in fact, to say on a scale of one to 10, how are you feeling today? Because what do we typically get when we ask that question? How are you feeling? Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, I'm fine, thanks. Yeah, I'm all right. We don't really get under the hood of what's going on. Whereas when you ask that question, how are you feeling today? And it's, uh, it's just what we do. People are on LinkedIn are doing this all of the time. Uh, a guy called Rob Stevenson created what's called the form score, um, which he every day he updates his LinkedIn profile with what number out of 10 he's currently on for that day. Um, and, and what it means to him in terms of how he's feeling. And he's a very big mental health advocate. But the, if we're able to bring this language and normalize it with our teams, then it means it's much easier for somebody to flag up and say, actually, I'm not feeling brilliant today. It might not mean that they need any kind of intervention. They just might need a little bit of extra space there, perhaps to, you know, to, to uh, know that they're being listened to, know that they're being seen, know that they're being understood, and that you're there for them if they need you. I think this is the key thing. We don't need to fix somebody necessarily if we are, uh, if they come to us and they say that they're struggling. Um, we need to find out what they want first of all. So this is a wonderfully powerful tool right from the start to, to have this and to have as that conversation starter as well. Um, we talk a lot about our mental health and, and actually putting these interventions and tools in place. This really is predicated on the, the understanding that we are able to change our brains essentially uh, and go from maybe having a fixed mindset, I can't do this, I've never been very good at doing that, I always struggle with X, Y, or Z, to this belief, this mindset, this attitude that we are able to change, we're able to improve, we're able to um, evolve. Uh, and we know that this is possible not just through the wonderful work of Carol Dweck at Stanford University, who really created the, the world of and the ideas behind growth mindset and fixed mindset, but by what we know about neuroplasticity as well, which is that we're able to reform, remold the neural pathways within our brains to physically change the shape of our brains over a period of time if we're able to actually implement some of the, the strategies, some of which we'll be sharing today. Uh, and again, I, I know that all of you will probably have fallen foul of this in the past, but you'll definitely have had um, be, uh, um, learners in your uh, cohorts who have a very fixed mindset. You just don't believe that they're capable of change and some who are ready to throw themselves into anything because they know that it doesn't matter if they fail, if they can't do it right now, it just means that they can't do it yet and that they'll be able to. So we see this all around us all of the time. So again, as um, as somebody who maybe has a cohort or think is thinking about ways to support their cohorts of early careers, this is a wonderfully powerful way of actually bringing that um, bringing those conversations out, listening in for that sort of growth or fixed mindset language. One of the big things that uh, links in with all of this is this idea of managing our energy through the day as well. <clears throat> we talk about mental health, uh, but mental health, mental energy emotional energy, physical energy, they're all different types of energy that will change and fluctuate through the course of the day. And you know, we know that there's different types of energy because if I just bring this, this slide up here, uh, 
you may have you may well have been through a day many days i'm sure where you've been sat down for the vast majority of the day uh, conserving calories conserving energy and maybe consuming more energy than you really need to. In fact, I'm gonna be absolutely open and honest right now. My wife brought me in a cup of coffee a little while ago, but she also brought me this. I was gonna show it to you now. This is like some of my, my son's birthday cake and it's been sitting there for the last hour and a half because I've been presenting this morning. But you know, we, 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 we have been consuming a lot more calories over the last 18 months perhaps and conserving a lot more as well. Um, Yet we can still get to the end of the day having sat down and consumed cake and still feel absolutely drained. No energy whatsoever, completely physically, physically, emotionally and mentally wrung out. So we know that these different balances are going on. And what can we do to uh, cut in on this cycle to actually bump up and boost that energy? And in fact, a lot of the work that, that we at Gen Healthy Minds have been doing for since we launched a couple of couple or so years ago, it's been looking at ways that we can act, practical ways we can encourage individuals to notice when they're starting to move into overwhelm and actually bring themselves back to that thrive zone. And in fact, let's take a look at this energy matrix right now. And you can see that we've got positive and negative, we've got high, and we've got low, and it's, hopefully it stands to reason that we want to be spending a lot of our time, the majority of our time in this positive and high energy zone. We want to feel like we are thriving. Physically, we, we've got that physical energy. We've got that, that emotional bandwidth to not only get ourselves through the day, but then to still have something left for the important people around us as well. And uh, I think we've all been in that boat where we feel like we've done just about got through the day, but then we're, we get snappy with the people who we should be, <laughs> who are supporting us and we should be showing love and care to and support to. Um, but we we haven't got any emotional bandwidth left. We, all we want to do is maybe sit down at the end of the day, open a bottle of wine, get a takeaway and have a binge session of uh, Netflix or something. So how do we manage the emotional energy? How do we manage that mental energy as well? Uh, mental thriving in the mental energy is where we feel like we can focus, we can concentrate. The task at hand is our sole focus. We're managing all these different elements as well. Uh, we're presenting, maybe we're we're consuming content and we're thinking about how it maps into our reality rather than getting distracted by what's out the window over there. Um, so we've got these different energies in this thrive zone and they can all be, we can perform at a high level with all of them. But we all know as well, just by experience more than anything, that we can't stay there forever. And what happens is eventually, if you keep pushing and pushing and pushing, eventually we, we, we maybe maintain that performance to some respect, to some regard, but now we start moving across to, it's now quite negative, and we're in this overwhelm or stress zone, where you know we, we need some stress to perform, but this is where we start moving into the realms of chronic stress, and it just doesn't feel good. And uh, perhaps those of you who are scoring lower on that mental health continuum, when I asked you, maybe if I were to meet you today, um, you would be, you'd present very positively, you'd be very happy, you'd be you'd look motivated, I'd probably think, oh, they've got their stuff together, they, they are absolutely on the ball here, but inside, it's much more of an effort, it just doesn't feel good. And we can manage this for some periods of time, we can manage that overwhelm for a, maybe a day or two, that stress can build up for a little while, but if we keep on going, if we keep on pushing, then eventually it starts to take its toll. And one of the things I'd highly recommend that you do and again you take to your various cohorts of early careers is to look at what are those stress indicators what are the the, the ways that those that, that stress manifests is it through irritability poor performance uh, lack of motivation is it um, more uh, increased or reduced appetite is it headaches a lot of people saying they're struggling with headaches or um, digestive issues as well so we've got lots of different early indicators, these overwhelm indicators that tell us that we've got to put the brakes on a little bit here, because if we don't, then there's a risk that we're going to end up not just in that negative, but now our energy is going to drop to a very low level because we are at risk of burnout. <clears throat> now, it doesn't just cycle through this um, sequentially. Often there's many other factors at play as well, workplace, environmental factors, personal factors. 
Uh, but, but essentially, if we keep on pushing when we know we're feeling that stress and we're not taking remedial action, then what happens uh, eventually is that we will end up with some form or some elements of burnout. And I don't know if anybody's ever experienced that, but it's probably not, uh, from what I've heard, I've not been there myself, uh, it's not uh, a fun place to be. In fact, I wrote an article on my LinkedIn about burnout. You might want to go and have a have a look at that to, to identify if you're uh, at risk of burnout and some of the different predictors and uh, different factors involved there. But look, this is a positive well-being session. There's some good news. There's an empty box still on this chart. So what could possibly be in there? It is the answer to all of our prayers. It is what's known as strategic recovery. Yes, it's still low, but now it's very positive as well. We have this deliberate, strategic, the clues in the name, strategic recovery activities or practices uh, where we are deliberately taking ourselves out from thrive, out from overwhelm, and we're just recovering, whether that's actual rest. So physical well-being is really important here, but it's not the only thing. Physical re uh, rest for sleep, diet, activity, all those things will have an impact on your performance, how you feel and how you perform in the workplace and in other areas of your life as well. Uh, when I was a personal trainer back about 20 years ago, when I first started in this in this world and working with people uh, like this, people would generally come to me and they say, George, I want to lose weight, tone up and get fit. And uh, what do I need to eat? What do I need to, how do I need to exercise? What should I do with my sleep to improve that, to achieve those goals? And although those goals are still really important now, I really shifted over the last decade or so my focus and attention um, and trying to encourage you, everybody, to look at these physical well-being factors, these elements of physical well-being, and how they relate to how you feel and perform right now, not just in the future, lose weight, turn up and get fit. How does it make you feel right now? Because it does have an impact and you've experienced it. Anytime you've had a bad night's sleep, you have to get up the next day and try and perform that's not performing at your best you know it's not harder to concentrate less people to lower people tolerance as well <laughs> people just annoy you more so that's the case for me when i haven't had much sleep um poor you have a big heavy stodgy lunch and then you struggle to stay awake in the afternoon so again we know that there are connections between what we eat how we move and how we sleep and even how we keep ourselves hydrated cheers that has a, an impact on our performance you don't have to be perfect but there are probably some ways we can start improving our physical well-being but other things as well in this strategic recovery we might build build meditation mindfulness practices in journaling perhaps connection with friends socializing some need that more than others getting into flow state doing things that you enjoy doing a hobby or a particular piece of work that energizes you. Any opportunity you have to use your strengths, your character strengths, and um, these are great ways to help you recover from the stresses of everything else that's going on and to recharge the, the batteries, the energy there. So we're gonna look at, that's kind of basically, that's theory, the last 25 minutes, we've, we've, I've shared with you some of the ideas, some of the backdrop to this, so I've thrown a few ideas at you as well and hopefully already you're starting to think how you can use some of this um, as we go through what i'm going to encourage you to do is to just jot down either in the chat um or uh either in the chat or just write them down on a piece of paper we can pop them in the chat or the questions at the end and actually i want to find out from you how you think you can implement some of these ideas into your workplaces what can you do, or just into your own lives for that matter? So start with you, fix your own oxygen mask first, uh, and then we can look at some of those, um, some of the ways we can implement this to your, uh, the workplace and support those around you. So there are five positive well-being practices that we're going to look at, and uh, there's a whole range of different things here. Some more obvious than others. Some you may have already be already come across and be doing. Some may be new or uh, new conceptually to you. Um, a lot of us are still working remotely. Uh, I know I am and a lot of the organizations that I'm working with are still remote working and that's the plan for at least the next two or three months. Some of this stuff is very relevant to that, but it will also expand to, to other areas as well. One of the, the, the number one strategy that I wanna share with you is, is this one, bookending the day. 
Um, I think, or if you think back to what it was like when we first went into lockdown back in March last year, and uh, for six weeks, and it was it was quite exciting to begin with for, for many people. And no, it wasn't exciting for for everybody, but uh, for some it was a bit of a bit of a jolly. And now we didn't have that commute either at the beginning of, or the end of the day. We had that that one back time. But how many of us now still have that protected one back time? And how many of us have had it gobbled up, gradually eroded by starting a little bit earlier, finishing a little bit later as well? The conversations that I've been having, I'd say that's the majority. Like we're, we're bouncing from home tasks, getting up in the morning, maybe checking emails first thing in the morning, have a quick look at social media too, maybe pop the news on so we can see what's happening in the world, not much. And uh, and then we 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 bumble around getting our stuff ready, and then we straight into work. So we don't have a we don't have this transition, this smooth transition from sleep to work at the beginning of the day. And there's not much of a transition at the end of the day either. If you're working from home, and previously if you're working from the office, <clears throat> you get in the car or you get on the train or the bus, and you commute home. You have that time that. You know, maybe you are still firing off a couple of emails or maybe you're listening to a podcast or reading a book or chatting to somebody on the phone or but you're doing something that's not necessarily work related whilst you're commuting. It's this decompression, this delineation between work and home. And we don't have that anymore. So bookending your day really is about saying, well, I'm going to win back the beginning of my day and the first 10 minutes, the first 30 minutes. I'm really selfish. I take an hour to an hour and a half at the beginning of the day for me. It means I have to get up a bit earlier to make sure that I can do that and make sure I'm around to help the kids get off to school and, and so on and so forth. But I take that time at the beginning of a day before I switch on my phone, before I check emails, before I check on what the rest of the world is asking of me in the day. So I have that gap at the beginning of the day where I'm disconnected, which allows me to reconnect with me and what's important for me, what's going to charge me up so that I can then be my best self through the course of the day. And I highly recommend that you examine and explore your own practices at the start of the day and maybe look at if there's something you can do to improve or to change that. It doesn't have to be an hour, but even just 10 minutes where you just sit quietly somewhere, have a cup of coffee or just a glass of water or do some stretching and just it's just for you. And then at the end of the day, if again you're working from home, instead of finishing up work, and then going straight into home life, have some kind of ritual that signifies the work day is over before you move on. This transition is really important to bookend the other, the other side of the day. My preference is to pack down all of my presenting gear, put it all away, um, and then I go for a commute. I go for a fake commute. I go for a couple of laps around the block, take my dog, take one of the kids, and I just go for a walk. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, maybe not far, but it's for me that time to stop thinking about work stuff, to decompress a little bit. And when I come back in, it's like right now I'm dad, now I'm husband, now I'm chef and I, I, I cook the, the evening meal or, or you know help with homework or all those things. But I have that commute time first. So what could be in your end of day ritual and how could you encourage those in your cohorts to do something similar as well. Because un when we don't have um, specific guidance on this, the tendency is usually towards just finishing a little bit later. I'll just finish up a couple of emails and just do this, just do that. It's like, oh, I better get the dinner on. And we're boom, straight into the next phase of the day. So we need to we need to claim that back. Nobody has said, I very much doubt, nobody has said in any organization, well, we've got that commute time, you must be working in that time now. It doesn't happen. We 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 made that brought that upon ourselves. It's up to us to reclaim it properly. So that's the number one. Number two are buffers and breaks. Now we all know how important breaks are, but buffers are a little bit different to that. Uh, in fact, breaks we don't we're not always that great at taking breaks. I think, and if we do take a break, maybe we're doing something also on screens. Maybe we're just taking a 10 minute break. So you're going to quickly check social media, take this break to send a few emails. That's not a break. There was a research study done by Microsoft recently, and uh, you may have seen it. There was a wonderful graphic 
um, where we had uh, some MRI scans of the brain for somebody who had four 30 minute meetings with no break in between versus somebody who had four 30 minute meetings with a 10 minute break in between. And you could clearly see the areas of stress building up in the no break brains and these calm, cool, blue areas in the brain. I don't think they're really blue, but in the MRIs they were of those who had taken those breaks. And I will say the study looked pretty robust, fairly small numbers, but otherwise pretty robust. They were doing a 10 minute headspace meditation in that time. But the point really, that might be a bit impractical for most of us or some of us anyway, but the point really is that taking breaks will boost your performance. We just need to be more disciplined about taking them. Again, think about going into the workplace. If you had a meeting, you'd be in a meeting room, you'd finish the meeting, you would leave the meeting room, and you may well have another meeting in five, 10 minutes time, but you wouldn't necessarily go straight into it. You'd maybe walk, you'd go and grab a coffee, you'd go and do something, and then you'd go, then you'd go back to your desk or into the next meeting. Uh, yeah, we don't have that because it's just it's just virtual. I just quickly bounce from Teams to Zoom to WebEx to uh, to Google Meet. There's so many different platforms. It's wonderful that we are so connected, but it also it's just become a bit easy. And we've got a bit lazy with being disciplined about booking these breaks in. They don't have to be these long 15, 10 minute breaks or uh, a full lunch break. We we can also bring in these buffers. And a buffer is just literally 30 seconds between activities, not just meetings, uh, but it's something that says, well, I finished that. Before I go on to the next thing, I don't want to take any of that emotional residue with me. I want to leave that behind and I want to turn up as my best self for this next thing. And I want to do that in 30 seconds. And the simplest way of doing this, in fact, how many have we got on the call at the moment? 46 of you. I want, to, I want 46 of you to experience this right now. Here's what I'd like you to do. Stand up. Right? Well, you're not on camera, so I can't see you. I'm just going to trust that you're doing this. If you're able to stand, please stand up for me. Okay. Then take a piece of string out of your pocket. Stephen, I can actually see you. So you've got no excuses for not doing this. <laughs> I won't stand up because otherwise you won't see what I'm doing. So piece, imaginary piece of string, take it out like this and tie it to the top of your head. This is like Webex theater now, Zoom theater, tied to the top of your head and then pull yourself up really tall and then release your hand and let your arms go back down by the side of your body again. So you're standing here with your arms to the side and just take a moment to notice what you notice about how you're standing, about your posture, about how your head is balanced on your shoulders, about how your shoulders are. Are they hunched forwards? Are they nice and open? What do you notice about your tummy? Has it drawn in slightly? instant weight loss, which they said was impossible, but there we go, just prove that it's not. How is your weight balanced through the feet left and right, forward and back? And you don't have to do the piece of string thing when you, uh, when you do this, but the, the checking in with your body, what that does is it gets you out of your head and into your body, which is a very, very quick and easy mindfulness technique. Uh, I just noticed that my camera seems to have just frozen there. Um, Stephen, is that the same for you? Can, am I still moving around or have I frozen? Still here loud and clear, but your camera has frozen, George. Okay, I'm just going to turn that off and then back on again and uh, see if that solves the problem. Give me two seconds, folks. Stay, stay standing because there's, uh, there's more coming up as well, uh, which will help with that. So I'm just going to cancel that. Just there we go. Come back. Yeah, you're back, and you're moving, George. So does that mean I've got to stand back I'm up? I'm moving. <laughs> oh, the professional. Okay, here we go. So back, back on your feet. We haven't finished yet. So we've just checked in with our bodies. And by the way, that in itself is incredibly powerful. If you've got just a few seconds between tasks, just stand up, check in with your body, and then sit back down again. But here's what I want you to do to go a little bit further than that: is to take one hand and place it on your chest, and one hand on your tummy. And just notice where the breath is coming into your body at the moment. Is it coming into your belly or is it coming into your chest? 
you'll probably get a little bit of chest movement, but what we really want is for your belly to expand first. That's what we're going for here. Try and feel the belly expanding, and then take a slightly deeper breath through the nose or the mouth, doesn't matter too much, and then a long, slow exhale. Don't breathe in so deep that you start feeling dizzy, but take another couple of three of these, deep breath, and that long, slow exhale. And one more time, deep breath in, and another long, slow exhale. And then sit back down in your chair again. Again, I know the chat isn't working for absolutely everybody, but I would love to hear from you as to how you felt after doing that. I know it's a little bit of a contrived situation. You're feeling very zen, chilled out, calm and excited and relaxed anyway, because here we are on a wonderful webinar talking about positive mental health and well-being. But how do you feel having just done that stand up, check in with your posture and breath exercise, those of you who actually did do it? So again, I, I won't be able to see if the chat does come up. And I know that comments and, and may not be coming up for absolutely everybody. So I won't dwell on that, but- um, going just, into the, I can read some out to you if you want, George, because they're going oh, yes, into the, into the questions them. box. The, um, yeah, so they've gone into there instead of the chats. So I'm not sure what's happening. Okay. Well, I have to say, I think that's the first time I've been a demonstrator on a webinar in, <laughs> in the past 14 months. So that's a new one on me. Um, so I've got comments like um, being chilled, mind feels a bit clearer, feeling more relaxed. Um, so yeah, good comments coming through on the back Excellent. of that. Excellent. Brilliant. And, and I think it's really worth also pointing out here that the more we're able to check in with just how we're feeling, a bit like that mental health one to 10 scale, just becoming aware of how we're feeling, what emotions we're experiencing, uh, what our levels of sort of activations, uh, activation is at any moment in time is a really powerful way of kind of managing that emotional intelligence is really about knowing what we're feeling, experiencing, and then being able to change that if appropriate. Uh, but that technique there is really, really powerful. Again, it just rapidly bringing you back to center. If you've had a stressful meeting or a phone call, you just finished the piece of work, that's a wonderful buffer that we all always have at our fingertips. You don't even have to stand up to do the breath work, but it just helps if you get the movement, physical movement, ideally move away from your screen as well, and then do the breathing. And Stephen, you were a wonderful demonstrator. Thank you very much. Uh, number three is to encourage physical well-being habits. Now, I'm encouraging you. I mentioned about diet, activity, sleep, hydration, a journal healthy minds. We talk about dash for performance. Dash not for weight loss, toning, getting fit, getting healthy. Yes, those things work, but dash for performance, diet, activity, sleep, hydration. How can you increase or improve your performance in each of those areas by just one point? And what I mean by that is if you think about diet, for example, when we decide the time has come for us to go on a diet, like January the 1st, or normally beginning of September is a real popular time for this as well, right? Time to go on a diet, shed some of the lockdown layer perhaps. And so we, you know, our diet practices are maybe a, what we score, maybe a three or a four out of 10. And we think, right, I've got to go to a 10 out of 10. I've got to quit sugar. I've got to quit the booze. I've got to go paleo, go vegan. I've got to go low fat, high fat. I've got to go 100%. So we go from a three to a 10. And of course, we all know how that ends up for most of us. We end up back down at the threes again at some point, that all or nothing crash and burn cycle. So how about this instead? How about thinking not just with diet, but with your activity, your sleep, your hydration habits? Uh, what could you do to move you from a three to a four? Or from a four to a five? Or from a five to a six, perhaps? This is the principle of plus one. And what it does is it builds confidence and momentum and, and results without feeling overwhelming. So you haven't got that whole, my goodness, this is unsustainable doing everything all at the same time. It's just gradually chipping away at it a little bit better, 1% improvements every day and see what a difference that makes. Far more, it's, it's maybe less exciting than going on a brand new diet and going all in, I got to this time, it's gonna work. Um, but it's definitely a more sustainable way. And in the long term, you'll get better results. Going back to what I said a moment ago, it's not just about the, the major reason why most of us will go on a diet because we want to lose weight, for example. But what we're saying here is these physical well-being practices will help your mental health. They'll help how you feel as well. And I would really like to think that you're in a position where you can encourage these positive, mental, uh, positive physical well-being habits with those who are in your charge as well. 
um, and just making it making it part of the conversations that you have, making it part of um, what you do and uh, and the support that you give to them as well. The, the training, perhaps, the, not just the encouragement, but the resources they need in order to make some of these smart decisions. I think that's such a good idea, George. I, I read a book, Atomic Habits, by James Clear recently, and he yeah. talked about that, especially that, like I said, three to ten. And um, he also talked about giving yourself points, and it's something I picked up. So, for example, you know, like doing 20 minutes physical exercise or something like that. And I kind of set a target of points for the weekend based on two or three things I need to know, I need to build into the week, that, um, yeah. that, um, that um, into a day that will, you know, just make the day go better. And it works. Funnily enough, I, I'm thinking about three months later, I'm still doing it. And kind of, and sometimes yeah. well, I need to do a bit more just to get to my 20 points for the week. And, it's, and I, I really agree, it's that. Break it down. Don't say that you've got to train yourself to run a marathon. You know, just yeah, just doing yeah. twenty minutes has worked very well. I mean, if you even think about, I mean, that's a great point. That's a wonderful book as well, James Clear, Atomic mm -hmm. Habits. Um, he, what if you think about physical exercise, right? The the government guidelines, which are pretty good for physical exercise, five times a week, thirty minutes of moderate intensity cardiovascular activity, right? So that that is what's needed for just maintaining physical health. It's not necessarily gonna be optimum for performance, optimum for boosting your energy, but that's like the baseline. But so many people don't even hit the baseline. And I think the reason for that is, well, I think, I don't know for a fact, but the conversations I've had over the last two decades with people is I just don't have the time to do 150 minutes of exercise each week. So when you break it down and say, well, how about 10 minutes a day, not 30? Well, I could probably do that, go for a walk. Uh, and actually, interestingly, with this moderate intensity activity is regarded as going for a brisk walk, not just a, a mooch around the, the supermarket or a little stroll around the park. It's a brisk walk, something that's going to get your heart rate elevated a little bit, but you don't have to go for a run to the gym to do a yoga class, hit workouts. You don't have to do that. It's great if you can, but you don't have to. Um, so we can actually make it a little bit more accessible, perhaps, by, by breaking it down. But yeah, if 30 minutes in a day just sounds like too much, then start off with what with 10 minutes. 10 minutes is better than nothing. And if you're doing 10 minutes, you might find it's easier to go from 10 minutes to 15 minutes and 15 minutes to 20 minutes. But going from naught to 30 could be enough to say, stop, I, I just can't fit that into my busy diary. Okay. Good stuff. So yeah, let's look at this next one there. The idea of planning as well. One of the things that we've noticed uh, in in hundreds, literally hundreds of conversations with early careers uh, since we've been working virtually over the last 12, um, 15 months or so is actually the challenge that so many of them have with planning their day. Now, this isn't just about planning um, for physical energy, which is what we're talking about here, but actually planning in general, like what should I be doing on a moment by moment basis through the course of a day? How do I actually schedule those things in? And what happens is their days just become a wash with meetings or having to be somewhere else. Then they get stressed that they haven't got this uh, time to actually spend doing the projects, to doing the work, to doing the things that need to get done. They get to deadlines and then the stress levels increase even more. So long range planning and day to day planning is really important as a technique to teach us why we build it into the Gen Healthy Minds programs. Um, but actually, we also use this te this technique for planning in the physical well-being habits. So like, when am I going to go and exercise? Like, if you don't put it on your schedule, it's probably not going to happen. I know that I knew that today the only time I was going to get to the gym to do a workout was first thing in the morning. So I planned it in in advance. If I hadn't done that, I'd have been getting to the end of the day thinking, oh, I'm running out of time. Am I going to get a chance to do a workout today? And then I'd have missed the workout and I'd have found a load of excuses as to why I'll be fine, I'll just do it tomorrow. That's fine every now and then, but you have enough of those, it'll be okay, I'll do it tomorrow's in a row. All of a sudden, you've, you've lost the habit, you're no longer exercising regularly. For me, exercise is really important um, for, for on a number of reasons, but I know I didn't train at all over the weekend, just two days, which um, is unusual for me to have two straight days where I don't do, in fact, three days, so I didn't train yesterday either. Um, and I was feeling really sluggish yesterday afternoon, actually very unproductive as well. I know for me personally, it has a massive negative impact on my productivity. So 
there's there's uh there's all sorts of reasons for why that didn't happen birthday weekends in the house and all sorts of other things and it was fine but i also knew that i had to prioritize it today to make sure that it got done and the reason that happened was because i planned it in planning in food planning in breaks as well planning in recovery activities planning in that fake commute at the end of the day when we talk about bookending the day and having that time at the end where you do something that's the transition from work to home so planning and encouraging that is really, really important as well. Uh, and then finally, we have this whole mental health conversation. If we loop straight back around to where we came in here today, talking about mental health, um, we have made tremendous progress in this conversation about mental health over the last year and a half. It's really, it truly has accelerated it wonderfully. But also on the converse, more people are struggling with their mental health. Um, and uh, you've no doubt observed some of that yourself, either personally or with those who you have um, working around you. So we really need to continue to evolve this and to keep this conversation at the forefront, but not just in a, we need to make sure that we're asking everybody all of the time, how are you feeling, how are you doing? And, and you know, the soothing, the big hugs, That's, that support is really important. But what we need is for it to just be absolutely normal that sometimes we're going to be feeling all right, sometimes we're going to be feeling a bit rubbish. And when you're feeling rubbish, like we're here, you come, and, come and tell us what you need. And over time, we get to know actually what individual people need to be supported. For me, I just need to be left alone for a little while. I don't need to be helped. I, it's one of the things that for many years stopped me talking about um, kind of mental health uh, with anybody was because I didn't want to be fixed. I didn't want somebody to say, oh, yeah, here's what you should do. It's like, I just need time and I'll be fine. Uh, so everybody is different. Uh, and actually on that note as well, this whole idea of the mental health conversation, if somebody comes to you and they share with you how they're feeling, all we need to do is to hold that space where they can share. Like we don't need to say anything apart from just letting them know that we're listening and that we understand and that we see them. And then if they say, I don't know what to do, what should I do? Then we've been given permission to say, okay, well, this is, here are some of the options. We could do this, we could do that, we could do that. that that's fine. But I think it's a, it's a gut reaction. Guys in particular, I've been terrible at this over the years. Not so bad since I've been more clued up on mental health and well-being and so on over the last sort of five or six years. But certainly I was a fixer. Like naturally I'm a fixer. Like someone comes to me with a problem, I can help you fix that. Let me tell you what you need to do. That's not what we need to be doing. That conversation about mental health is just normalizing it in such a way that people feel like, yeah, that's game. Okay. It's absolutely normal for me to be down at a three or a four. Um, but if I'm down at a three or four for a few days, then I'll probably want to be flagging that up and saying, actually, you know what? I could do with a bit of a hand. And the more you guys can encourage those kinds of conversations, encourage that kind of culture where it's normal and expected to for, for people to not just uh, pendle them up and down this continuum, but to, uh, to, to know what to do and how to deal with it if they are down at the low end, then we're in a very strong position, I think, to truly support physical and mental well-being as well. So what I've tried to share with you today has been a number of tools that you can use personally there's some, hopefully there are some takeaways. I'd love to know what they are but for, from you. But what I really want to know now as well is like, how do you think you can encourage more of these practices to support the well-being and performance of your early careers cohorts? How could it map across to your reality? We talked about the theory. I've given you some examples and some of the situations that, that, that I've come across, different organizations that, that we've worked with at Gen Healthy Minds. But what about for you? Where does this translate for you? And we can maybe use the questions or the, the chat again here to, to, to let us know, or for that matter, what are you already doing that's working? How are you already supporting the, the, the well-being, mental, physical, emotional well-being of your cohorts? What are some of the best practices and perhaps we can use the remaining time we have today to share some of those? So somebody perhaps who is maybe not quite so sure how this is going to translate, get some inspiration and some ideas. So I'm going to um, open up. 
Yeah, just while people are, um, oh, actually, we have one else going to say, while people are sort of thinking and putting stuff in. So um, somebody's, uh, Frankie's put the suggestion of a well-being toolkit. Mm -hmm. but what do you mean by that, Frankie? What, what are, um, do you want to expand on that slightly, just in, either in the, the questions or maybe you can come off mute. Are we, do we have that facility, Stephen? No, so we can can't, I'm off? afraid, yeah, it doesn't, because okay. um, we're on the, because there's so many, actually, the, this platform doesn't do it. It's not like quite like Zoom. No, that, that's fine. Well, use, use your chat. Tell us what you mean, because I like the idea of a well-being toolkit. I've come across that before in different contexts. So love to know what uh, what your thoughts are on that. So um, Frankie's come back. He said a, a place where a place on the Internet where colleagues can access useful resources. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah, yeah, wonderful. So almost like a hub uh, and something. It's just another way to signpost. In fact, one of the things we do at Gen Healthy Minds is uh, we actually have an app that is uh, the, a lot of the, 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 the organizations that we use will take on because everything is brought together in that. There's lots of kind of coaching examples as well uh, to help people through challenging situations through their early careers, um, checking in with how they're feeling as well. Uh, and it's got a whole host of resources. So any hub, any app you can have that's gonna help people uh, centra help you centralize all of this advice and support is a wonderful, uh, way to just get that conversation started. Definitely. Um, and then, uh, uh, Frankie said, yes, exactly, a hub. So that's exactly what, um, um, what they were thinking of. Um, yeah. uh, coming from Tessa. So Tessa says, um, leaders, role modeling vulnerability is great. So I think that's a good idea. People actually, um, you know, talking about their own experiences rather mm -hmm. than this, um, you know, somebody in the ivory tower who's, you know, some sort of superhuman that, um, that yeah, that never, never, never feels um, this kind of stuff. Yeah, that, that's a great one. But vulnerability is such a, um, a huge topic of interest for so many at the moment. It's a real um, sort of leadership uh, area. But the more you're able to demonstrate that vulnerability um, within, you know, the boundaries of whatever feels comfortable and right for you as well. I think we need to be quite careful here that, that being vulnerable shouldn't because you think that it's what a good leader should do um, is not the right approach. Uh, it needs to feel authentic, otherwise it will crash and burn and you can end up getting hurt as well. In fact, I interviewed a uh, psychologist for my, I have a podcast called A Bit of a Boost and I have a, an interview on there with a psychologist on the topic of vulnerability, which might be worthwhile checking out as well. Um, Charlotte's mentioned walking one-to-ones. I slipped a disc a few years ago, and when I went back to work after a bit of time off, I still really couldn't sit for very long. So I remember doing um, some appraisals walking, and it really felt weird at first. But after actually you just kind of got your head around the unusual way of doing it, they actually really worked. So I actually think they were they were better. So I think that's a great idea from Charlotte, actually just doing more stuff when you're physically moving and getting, getting yeah. out of the desk. And also just on that, you know, with a virtual world that we're in at the moment, uh, we, we sometimes feel so constrained to sitting in front of the camera, having our cameras on in a meeting or similar. Um, and you know, everyone apart from me and you today, Stephen, we're, we're here on camera, but everyone else could potentially have been up on their feet, walking around, plugged in, either looking at the screen or just listening to what I'm talking about. Um, and I think that we have that opportunity to just go back to some of our in meetings as being phone calls rather than always having to be on video, because then you can pace around, you can move about, get into the garden perhaps as well. Um, so there are lots of opportunities now, I think, to, to bring in that rather than feeling that we have to be constrained um, to be on video all of the time. Isn't there some evidence coming through that actually the this being on video all the time that people are starting to realise that our our brains actually our brains aren't used to seeing our own faces quite so much as we do when we're on Zoom calls and things. And we, if you think if we're normally in a meeting room, we would sometimes be looking out the window or we'd yeah. be a bit more a bit more mobile in what our eyes are looking at rather than just staring at a screen and, and faces so so intently. Yeah. And when I read that, yeah, I think it was quite actually, quite early on actually this was this was kicking in quite early on where. People were talking about Zoom fatigue in particular. Um, and what, what's happening is it's not just that you're seeing yourself, but you're quite right because you are you feel like, well, I've got to be here. I've got to be staring at the camera the whole way through for 40 minutes or an hour. And of course, you know, if you were in a meeting, you wouldn't just be staring. You'd be looking around, you may be making your notes. So it, it's, it can be quite stressful. And what's happening is your mental bandwidth has been eaten up by all this other this information. I mean, for me right now, I'm here sitting here presenting um, I've got the, the video screen and I'm keeping my fingers crossed that the video doesn't crash again. <laughs> so I've got that in the running, that track running in the background. I've got my questions box here. I've got another screen here with my presentation on. Uh, I've got the screen share that I did earlier on as well. I'm flicking between the chat 
the questions and my sharing controls over here too. So there's there's a lot more that's taking up that that mental bandwidth, which can then narrow the available bandwidth for actually really listening and paying attention to what's going on and, and who's speaking to us. Um, you know, especially if you also have notifications pinging up. That's one thing I really hope that you know, everyone is has the ability to do and to encourage others as well. Take all notifications off, off your desktop, off your laptop, off your phone, get rid of notifications. You don't need notifications to be popping up. You can always go in and check emails, social news headlines. You don't need to have those notifications because they're massive distractors. We want to gain traction. We want to eliminate those external distractions. Um, and I've kind of got, gone off on a bit of a tangent there, but our, our mental energy, as we spoke about earlier, has never been more challenged than, than it has recently. And it's wonderful that we have the opportunity to be connected, to remain connected in this way. It's fantastic. And of course, GoToWebinar has been around for a very long time. It's not a new thing, same as Zoom, same as Meet and so on. But we do need to be mindful of that. And too many of these meetings through the day can be quite stressful. So meeting hygiene is another thing that we can start to think about bringing in and maybe encouraging our early careers to be mindful of that. Booking meetings in, if they're the ones who are booking, for 25 minutes instead of 30, 55 minutes instead of 60, um, for uh, booking time out in the day where you're unavailable for meetings, so you're not just bouncing from one to the next. But yeah, great yeah, question. Good. Mike, Mike right. suggested those as well, actually, um, and some comments he's put on here, buffers between every meeting, shorter meetings. But if we did that with our um, some of our forums, instead of an hour, we put them in for 50 minutes. And broadly stuck to it, actually. Sometimes it overran slightly, but it's that reminder that, no, let's let's have at least a break so people can stand up, grab a quick coffee or tea before the next meeting started. Um, I'm conscious of time, but there's a few comments on here I thought would also be good to, to run through yet. Yeah, so Mike's mentioned uh, meetings, um, had a comment from Ben. Um, they've run a well-being challenge with teams of four to five and um, people getting points for competing certain physical and mental well-being activities. Um, a comment here from, oh yeah, from Annabelle about HR being, um, being reinforced by senior members within their team. Mm -hmm. Um, Anthea's talked about similar to walking to ones, one to ones, but having a weekly slot blocked out so that your early careers cohort, um, a slot they know about, so they can just drop in to chat to you, and um, whether it's just to say hello or, or to talk about what's on their on their mind, because often as Annabelle, um, I'm sorry, Anthea says she only hears from our cohorts when they've reached that point just before yeah. burnout um and um and then it can be be too late and i because you were saying weren't you just before you um or you said i think you said to be just before we started george you're actually doing a session this morning is that right with a group of students before they even join the organization yeah. so that yeah, really yeah. is getting ahead of the, ahead of the so, uh, yeah so, it just kind of, so they hit the ground running when they start in september um some things to think about with putting emotional awareness um we talk about gratitude logging gratitude as well um checking in the, we did the mental health score as we as i did with you guys earlier on as well so there are lots of things it's wonderful to have this opportunity as i said to, to share some of those the ones that, that we that we've seen at gen healthy minds but also crowdsourcing some best practices from all of you as well um, i'll just finish this off as well with this slide um, if anybody is interested in finding out more about gen healthy minds and some of the work that we've been doing and and can offer the ways that we can support you then Again, another QR code here, or just go to genhealthyminds.co.uk forward slash contact hyphen us. Um, we can find me, uh, Mike Thompson is uh, the other, um, uh, the, the, the lead from Gen Healthy Minds. Find us on LinkedIn, and uh, we'd love you to have a conversation with you about some of the things that we can bring to supporting you as well. Fantastic, George. Well, we should, we've not finished early, so we should, maybe we should have built a five minute buffer into our yes. webinar. So yeah, we haven't done that. But, no, I've not yeah. done that. <laughs> But let's um, finish, finish on, on time. time. Hannah, that's, that's even yeah, more we'll important. Finish on time. Hannah's just put a note in saying thanks very much. So, yes, that was a really great session. So um, as I said, um, you will all get a link to the video of this. So um, you can go back and pick up on anything else that you've missed. Please get in contact with George, as he said, through 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 the link there. Um, we'll be bringing you more content on, on, on mental health, um, hopefully for the summer into the autumn. Um, some of you will have done Tessa's course. We ran with Tessa um, a bit early this year. Um, and we hope to bring that again back this autumn. So keep your eyes out on that but and as we said i think this is a really important topic for ourselves personally but also um for for the people that we're bringing into work we can't make the stress go away from well we can't stop jobs being stressful can we george but hopefully we can give everyone the tools to deal with it better exactly
Thanks, everybody. That's great. Thanks for your time, George. Um, see you all soon. Bye now.